gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again, just thankful for the opportunities that you do give us to feast upon your word, to fellowship together over the grace and the truth that you've given us. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is not true, but just seal to our hearts only that which is true. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're continuing on in our study in the book of Revelation verse by verse. And in my last video, we began to look at the church at Philadelphia in chapter 3. This video will continue that study to the letter to the angel at the church at Philadelphia. What we saw was that Jesus said that he was holy, that he was Jehovah, uh, Jehovah God, a very God. We know that from Isaiah. He states that he's sovereign, he's, he's truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth. That he has the key of David, that he's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, the ruler of the new Jerusalem, which is our home above, and the Lord of the kingdom of heaven. So he has the authority. He has the sovereign will and authority. He that opens and no man shuts and shuts that no man opens, he opens the doors to ministry as well as all circumstances in our lives, doors which no man can shut. He is a holy, true, sovereign God who's concerned about every minute detail of our lives, who is, who is personally involved in each one of our lives. He knows His messengers. He knows His people by name. He knows this messenger's works, but He will not be judged by His works, plural, but His life's work, singular. When we look at the judgment seat of Christ, it is how we built on Christ. And no man can shut that open door. God has ordained our steps. He's ordained our very lives, particularly in relationship to service, the gospel of Christ, the teaching of the Word, where, we, where the, a door is opened to the faith of the Gentiles or His faithfulness to the Gentiles. He mentions that this angel, this messenger, he has a little strength. I, I pointed out the word is micro, hardly any. That's nothing compared to God's strength. That He was not wholly dead as was the messenger at Sardis that we looked at. And as long as that was the case, the door was still open for Him to preach the Word. But Thou hast kept My Word. Even though you have little strength, you have kept My Word and you haven't denied My name. And then I touched on verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue that's not the church of, but the synagogue of Satan, which say that they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I've loved thee. And I think that to many Christians, including myself, I have to place my own self in this category. Often in the past, we've tended to look at these verses as somewhat of a mystery. You know, well, this is sometime in the future. This is perhaps at Bema that He causes them to come and worship before Thy feet. Well, they're, they're not going, the non-believers are not going to appear at Bema. Now, it could be that if, if you take these of the synagogue of Satan as believers, they will appear at Bema. But on the other side of the, of, of the equation, we are not going to appear at the judgment seat, at, at the great white throne judgment. We're not going to appear, we're not going to be present at the great white throne judgment of non-believers. I don't think that the future tense is pointing that far ahead into the future. What I think is that the future tense is just common to, to the language, to the grammar, as being some, sometime future. It doesn't have to be 2,000 years into the future. I will make them bow down before uh, they, they will bow down before this messenger's feet. We're still looking at the singular folks here, okay? The feet of the messenger and worship. And of course, 
we, we look at the word worship, and, and any of you Greek students out there know the word can mean just show reverence or respect. And know that He has loved thee, the messenger, singular. And so those, though it's singular, the messenger and the message, okay, I believe are, are in, intrinsically linked together. The mess, angel means messenger, messenger, uh, messenger being a noun, the message also being a noun. Uh, they, they are can almost be interchanged. The message of the, the to the angel of the messenger of the church at Philadelphia, right? He's speaking to the messenger, and so. The messenger, I believe, as well as the church, if you want to include that, I don't have any problem with that, but the messenger can expect to see, and I did, I, I do believe that he did see in the, near, in the near future, in the very near future, in his own life, he did see that God did make, and, and the word make is give in the Greek, okay? The word in the Greek is give. God gave. Some of them. The, the Greek word denotes some, not all. So he gave some, not all, but he gave some, okay, to come. Now that's what the original text states. I believe it's he, he gave some to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, no doubt, folks, that there were, without a question, there were early converted Jews in the church just like Paul. The reason why they met, uh, they, well, the Christians first met in synagogues. They were Jews. The first converts were Jews. No doubt they were early converted Jews. This, I believe this is speaking to of, of try to paint a picture in your mind of early converts from Judaism to Christianity coming at a near time in the future, a guarantee from our Lord that He would make, or in other words, He would give some, not all, to come and worship before His feet and know that Christ had loved this messenger. That's what I'm looking at. You know, uh, I guess in our case, I, it makes me think of Messianic Jews today or, or even Judaizers within Pro Protestantism, legalizers, okay, who are given, given by God to, to, to pay homage, to pay respect, that is respect, the message that they formerly blasphemed, the message that they formerly persecuted, the message that they formerly ridiculed. I believe the Lord is comforting this messenger by saying, he has his own. He will bring them. And, and it's not 2,000 years into the future, but he will bring them to, to pay respect to the message or the messenger concerning the message that they persecuted. And no synergism. You, you can't... You, the, the very passage screams out that there's no synergism involved in this. I will, okay, bring some of them. Verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. And I, po I pointed out, I believe that in first perseverance, uh, preservation. And that is Christ's patience. It's the, it's the patience of, of, of a kind that, that ensures the same persistence that Christ had in spite of all of the suffering, all of the op opposition, all of the persecution which came his way, which was directed toward him. Verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. And that is not, well, I'm coming in a few days, but that is at God's appointed time, says the word in the original text. Hold that fast which thou hast. Hold that fast. Hold, cling tenaciously. It's to grasp and, and hold to tenaciously that no man take thy crown. And I pointed out that no one can take your redemption, but they can certainly take your crown. The text directly states that 
you know, for for the text to, to say that don't let no man take thy crown implies that a man can take your crown. How would he do that? Well, first, the word is Stephanos. That's not, uh, I've always loved the fact that that's my name, Stephen. That's where we get Stephen, the word Stephen. Stephanon, Stephanos, in the, in the, uh, the, the sentence construction, the actual word is Stephanon. It was a wreath, it was a garland, it was awarded to a victor in the ancient athletic games like the Greek Olympics. It's the, the crown of victory, okay? Uh, now, there's another word. It, it's, it's different than, than uh, Stephanon. It's diade diadema. It's, it's where we get the word diadem. It's, it's a royal crown. That's not our crown. It's Stephanon's. It's used of a plated wreath like the one made of thorns placed on the head of our Lord when He was uh, brought to trial. And when he was uh, severely persecuted, I want to ex try to explain the nature of true ministry on which reward is based. I think it's it's only appropriate, it's only proper that we at least touch on the nature of true ministry, what true ministry is. Well, we know that true ministry is not self; it's not exalting self. It's not flaunting self. It's certainly not on the side of, of pride and elevating self. But it's, it's, not, it's also not self in the sense of, of promoting self as, uh, in the sense of self-righteousness, self-works, self-reliance. Folks, our trust is in Him, not ourselves. Our confidence is in Christ, not ourselves. If you're living... In, 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 with, in, with, if your relationship with Christ, folks, is, is one in which you, you have confidence in the flesh, that you're, you're walking in the flesh according to the flesh, according to law, not the Spirit, not grace, then your message, your life, your testimony, your ministry is going to be reflect the, the, the same idea. The nature of true ministry revolves around the fact of, that our, our message, our ministry, our life is a testimony to what Christ has done in our lives, what He's doing presently in our lives, and what He will do in the future. That is the concern. I am absolutely convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that's the concern. Uh, that, was the, that was the Lord's concern when He wrote these words to this messenger. As, as with all the rest of the other churches, same concern. The concern was is that the message, the life, the relationship, the walk, everything about that individual, whether they be a messenger or whether they be just a, a believer in general, the concern is that no man takes our crown. And the only way that, that we can allow any man to take our crown is to allow men, the doctrine of men, as opposed to the doctrine of Christ, to take and permeate our lives. Behold, verse 11, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Okay, so it's, it, it describes the true ministry on which reward is based. It's Christ, not self. It's spirit, not flesh. It's grace, not law. Him, verse 12, him that overcometh. And I've, we've touched on that word overcome. The only overcomers are those who for whom Christ died. And it's at, in, that you can claim the title of an overcomer, folks, if Christ died in your place. To him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Now what does a pillar do? It supports the temple. 
and he shall go no more out. It, it, this, the very words, folks, denote permanency. Okay? And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. That's, folks, is a lot of writing. Okay? Read it again. I will write upon him the, uh, the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Okay? Clearly, folks, the emphasis is on the fact that God owns us. We were bought with a price. Therefore, we are to glorify God in our body. It fits right into the previous verse regarding our crown. In fact, if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I want to briefly touch on the body being a temple of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Even in the authorized version, it said that the, sub, the title should say, The body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The body, okay? The body of Christ, not your individual body, okay? But the, the corporate body of Christ is a temple, a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in the body. Flee fornication. Now, we can take that as physical fornication, but I believe primarily the, the inference there is spiritual fornication. That is, being married to Christ, but having an endless flirtatious affair with the law in the flesh. Folks, you don't belong to the law. You don't belong to the flesh. You belong to Christ. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, the body of Christ. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. You're sinning against the body of Christ if you're involved in fornication. What? Know ye not that your body... Now listen to me, folks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain this as it is in the original text, looking strictly at the grammar. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Fits right in, plugs right in, okay, to Revelation chapter 3 here, the church of Philadelphia. And then he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Lord says that this messenger has, has kept the word of his patience. His patience. And I find that amazing. I've always found it amazing that, that many of the things, and I've often wondered how often in our lives do we go through circumstances in our lives? And, and are we involved in experiences which actually mirror the life of our Lord without even realizing? He says He'll keep us. He'll keep us away from I believe I can prove that it's away from in the majority of the manuscripts. The very hour we cannot be in it, that hour of testing, which we know is the tribulation period, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Dwell on the earth. That is, they have made this earth their permanent abode, their permanent abiding place. Folks, we have an abiding place, but that abiding place is Jesus Christ. It was many years ago, 40 some odd years ago, that I came to, by the grace of God, to understand that as a, a new creation in Christ, that I was not under law, but I was under grace. If you look at every single one of these letters, it reflects the very same teaching of Paul in 13 epistles. The Lord's concern here that He's speaking through John to these messengers was the very same concern that the Holy Spirit had when He was speaking to Paul. No different at all. 
These letters are full of grace, full of truth, full of wisdom, full of wonder. These letters show us what the condition of the church, what the condition of the church will be prior to the Lord's return. We've got one more letter. That's the church of Laodicea. Or that there's a passage there in that, in that letter that uh, has no doubt brought discomfort to many of God's people. I would rather that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's the message the Lord finds distasteful, not His people. So that's it. I want to just stop and, and thank you folks for all of your prayers, your continued prayers and your messages of concern and, and support for this ministry and what we're trying to do here at BlessedHopeForever.com. I love you all. I truly do. I ask you to, to continue to keep me in your prayers. I believe I'm on my way to recovery. I'll know more uh, for, for certain uh, on December 22nd. So I'll keep you updated. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.